First up, uh, Catherine Hu, one of our senior residents, she is staying here at Moran to do cornea. Um, Catherine was recently married. Turns out her husband is Polish. And so you may not know uh, that uh, Catherine has been learning Polish. And if you are interested in learning some Polish phrases, feel free to reach out to her. She's going to speak to us about uh, inflammatory deposits um, in ocular syphilis. Doctor Who. Can Catherine, everybody hear me okay? Muted. Okay. Can everybody hear yeah. me? Okay? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Oh, perfect. And see the screen? Yes. Fantastic. All right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm excited to be presenting one of my research projects today as a senior resident. Um, so just to jump right in. So like many great research questions and scholarly inquiries, this one started with a phone call from Dr. Chris Conradi. Uh, for who, those who don't know, he was one of our brilliant and beloved former residents and then our UVITIS fellow. Uh, he went on to do his retina fellowship at Michigan. So naturally one day he called me to talk about his favorite topic, which was syphilis. Uh, anecdotally, he had noticed a unique OCT finding that he had only seen in patients with syphilis, and he was swearing that it was pathognomonic. He was saying, you know, uh, to the point where if a, pa a patient came to, into his clinic with unexplained acute vision loss uh, and these OCT findings, um, he was pretty convinced that he could guess, you know, with 99% certainty that they had syphilis even before serologic testing returned. So pretty, pretty compelling. Um, Watch the research and watch calls, but I can help yeah, you. With uh, I have seen. He described these subretinal uh, pyramidal lesions. Uh, so he described these uh, subretinal pyramidal lesions with these characteristic sharp peaks extending from the RPE into the outer nuclear layer, often with disruptions in the ellipsoid zone. And um, this became the basis of our research question and a point of curiosity that we wanted to explore. So uh, just some background, ocular syphilis is observed most often during the secondary or late stages or of syphilis with posterior uveitis and panuveitis being the most common eye findings. In the Western world, the annual incidence of intraocular syphilis is 0.3 cases per 1 million adults, which is a fairly rare diagnosis. Um, however, uh, prevalence of syphilis, including ocular involvement, has continued to rise since the early 2000s. And although ASPPC or acute syphilitic posterior placoid chorioretinitis is a well-described um, is a well-described subtype with um, distinct retinal clinical findings and also well-documented imaging characteristics, other subtypes and imaging findings of ocular syphilis have not been as well described in the current literature. So that boiled down to our research question. It was basically, do these hyper-reflective, uh, presumptively inflammatory pyramidal deposits serve as a potential non-invasive biomarker for syphilitic uveitis, the ones that Dr. Conradi had described and seen you know, in the day-to-day -day clinic? Um, and the purpose of our, of our research was to better characterize these lesions as an additional finding in syphilitic uveitis, but also ultimately to evaluate the role of OCT in the diagnosis of syphilitic uveitis. And the big question and the big picture was hopefully leading to more timely diagnosis and treatment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So our study was a multi-center consecutive retrospective case series. All patients were identified via EMR from 2012 through 2020 at both the University of Utah here and also our partnership with the University of Michigan. Um, and both of our centers are large academic tertiary referral centers for uveitis. <clears throat> excuse me, have bad allergies. <laughs> um, we included all adults with intermediate uveitis, posterior uveitis, or panuveitis secondary to syphilis, uh, for which diagnosis was made through clinical examination as well as confirmatory serologic testing. No patients were excluded except in cases where there were no concurrent imaging records available. And of course, we also looked at clinical data, um, including vision, laboratory analyses, and also retinal imaging. In our analysis of our OCT, a patient was considered to have a positive OCT finding only if they demonstrated a total of three or more hyperreflective pyramidal lesions on OCT scan that extended from the RPE, as we had previously uh, described, uh, into the outer nuclear layer with disruption of the ISOS, uh, ISOS junction um, by two reviewers, myself and Dr. Conradi. Um, these were uh, images that we reviewed at the initial visit. We also reviewed all lines of the scans from the presenting, um, presenting visits and also all follow-up visits. And results were considered negative if us as reviewers could not come to a consensus. The resolution of pyramidal lesions was considered complete only if the hyperreflective pyramidal lesions had disappeared and at least some of uh, the ISOS junction had been reconstituted in that same area that was apparent. 
Um, so this is one patient that we had described. Um, he had HIV and also a history of treated neurosyphilis, but there was concern of treatment failure and recurrence of disease about six months after his initial presentation and initial uh, round of treatment. He presented with worsening visual acuity of 2150 in the affected eye with the development of these lesions on OCT had previously not been seen before. And he also had an uptrending uh, RPR titer, despite not having any additional exposure. Um, however, after undergoing a second uh, round of IV penicillin alone, the pyramidal deposits completely resolved as early as two weeks after his initial dose, um, and then the um, and his uh, vision returned to 2020. And you can see here that the arrows correspond to the anatomic location of the lesions in resolution after treatment. So uh, of our results, we had 40 patients representing 62 eyes uh, from, the two, um, from the two centers, and the mean age was 42.9, and 87.5% of the patients were men. Pan-uveitis and posterior uveitis were far more common than isolated intermediate uveitis, and 90% of patients were treated with a standard two-week course of IV penicillin as directed by each institute's inter, uh, infectious disease uh, subspecialty services. 45% of our patients, um, about 43% of our patients had a underlying diagnosis of HIV, uh, which was a new diagnosis for seven patients. In terms of the OCT findings that we were um, particularly curious in looking at, uh, 28 eyes or 45% of our patients showed these hyperreflective pyramidal lesions on OCT. 54% of these eyes with these lesions um, did not have a retinal placoid lesion or really any uh, retinal lesion for that matter that could be detected on either examination or other imaging modalities like autofluorescence. Um, no unaffected fellow eye demonstrated these lesions and complete resolution of these pyramidal lesions was found on OCT for 68% of eyes after treatment. Um, so finally, we also looked at uh, follow patients longitudinally for visual recovery. And at the time of diagnosis, visual acuities ranged from 2020 to NLP with a mean of 2043 on a cell and eye chart. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, after IV antibiotics, uh, after after treatment with IV antibiotics, uh, statistically significant improvement was observed in mean acuity, uh, in mean acuity excuse me, to 2026 with a p-value of uh, 0 0.01, and 68% uh, of patients. Uh, gain at least one line of visual improvement after treatment with IV antibiotics. There was no correlation found between presenting or final visual acuity and the presence or absence of the OCT lesions that we were looking at. And vision-threatening long-term complications were overall uncommon, you can see here, uh, with pretty low percentages. Um, however, they did span from optic neuropathy, retinal detachment, um, CME, and also disease relapse, including these uh, long-term complications that were permanent and also had um, Visual, uh, visual deficits and consequences. So uh, just to wrap up with a quick discussion, our experience suggests that hyperreflective outer pyramidal deposits of the RPE and outer retina can be found in ocular syphilis. In addition, but not in place of routine specific treponemal and non-treponemal serologic testing of patients with uveitis, these non-invasive image findings may serve as a non-invasive characteristic clinical finding to monitor disease activity and, uh, and also treatment, um, treatment um, response and treatment efficacy. Um, most of these outer retinal abnormalities resolve after IV penicillin um, therapy, as seen in our, specifically in our study, and can be uh, may resolve within two weeks of starting therapy, which is much more rapid than RPR responses. And um, lesions were observed in the absence of ASPPC, or basically in the absence of uh, placoid lesions. And um, similar lesions, peaked triangular lesions, have been described in three prior case reports to our knowledge in the current literature, um, but only as exclusively, as exclusively associated with ASPPC. So to our knowledge, no prior reports have suggested that they may be found in patients without ASPPC. And resolution of these lesions coincided with good visual recovery. We actually especially, uh, speculate that all lesions would have eventually resolved. Ours was a 68% uh, resolution rate with treatment of IV penicillin. Um, however, <clears throat> however a, so a small subset of our patients um, were lost to follow up or returned care to their local ophthalmologist for which we don't have records. So just some key points. Um, if left untreated, ocular syphilis may lead to irreversible vision loss. And um, as we all know, uh, can be considered the great masquerader of ocular disease. <clears throat> 
ocular inflammatory disease uh, since it has the propensity to mimic many, many other diseases. So timely identification and treatment may improve of um, not only um, ocular syphilis, but also neurosyphilis, and may not only improve uh, visual outcomes, but also patient morbidity and life expectancy. And um, the importance of testing for HIV co-infection, as we saw, 45% of our patients uh, had <laughs> HIV and seven was a new diagnosis uh, with the presentation of their eye findings. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone. We were fortunate enough to publish our findings in, um, in ophthalmology retina. And we had, of course, an all-star team. I'd like to give especially, of course, thanks to Dr. Vitali, Dr. Shakur, and Dr. Marissa LaRochelle, who have been just instrumental in my uh, overall ophthalmology career. Um, <clears throat> as well as our colleagues at Michigan at the uveitis department. And then of course, Dr. Chris Conradi, who's the real MVP, um, who is just a rock star in my book. These are my references and I'd like to take any questions. Are there any questions for Catherine? I didn't see anything in the chat. That was wonderful. Thank you. Catherine, congratulations. So very impressive. I'm a little bit sad that you're not going into retina. <laughs> so I, I, would be, I would be very much interested in the structure function correlation. Yes. So you reported that 54% of patients showing this OCT sign had no other clinical signs. <clears throat> they have functional deficits. And is there work done in regard to, um, for example, correlating um, Micropyramidry with these changes? Yeah, that's a great, uh, that is a great question. I'm not quite sure in terms of that specific uh, other imaging modalities. And of course, you know, with the structure, function, and correlation, like you said, we aren't able to, in most of these cases, we aren't able to biopsy. So we don't know exactly what's going on. And the evolution of these lesions were not quite. Um, well defined yet, and we're not quite understanding what they actually are. Um, like we said, we assume that they're inflammatory lesions. Um, but yes, there was 54% where there wasn't a, um, at least there wasn't a grossly obvious placoid lesion, um, but there were other signs of, you know, posterior panuveitis uh, or, or intermediate uveitis even. We have one comment from Emmy Hartnett. She said, great presentation, Catherine. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Very good. All right, thank you, yeah. Catherine. We'll uh, move on to uh, Marshall Huang. Um, Marshall um, is one, another one of our senior residents. Uh, he is uh, leaving us to do glaucoma um, in Minneapolis at the uh, Minnesota Eye Consultants. Marshall's gonna talk to us about a prospective clinical trial assessing the effect of NMN on dry AMD. Now, as far as a fact that you may not know about uh, uh, Dr. Huang, um, he apparently once was inadvertently included in a photo series that went viral, uh, uh, the photo series taken by Angelo Marandino about his uh, wife's breast cancer uh, experience. Uh, and no, I did not know that about you, uh, Dr. Huang. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hoffman, for that kind introduction. Uh, today, I'll be discussing my project on NAD plus supplementation for non exudative macular degeneration. My only financial disclosure is that ProHealth provided the NMN supplements free of charge. The primary objective of this project is to determine whether supplementation of a NAD plus precursor results in a change in the FLEO pattern seen in uh, AMD patients. The primary outcome for this project will be the change in the FLEO pattern of the mean fluorescence lifetimes in a long spectral channel from enrollment to final study visit as measured by FLEO. The secondary outcomes uh, include visual acuity and contrast sensitivity. I will now discover, uh, discuss the rationale behind using NAD plus. The first question is why would supplementation of NAD plus be helpful in AMD? Although we, the exact pathogenesis of AMD remains unelucidated, we know that RP dysfunction and degeneration are key features of age-related macular degeneration. The RP is uniquely metabolically active in order to provide support to the retina. Its functions include phagocytosis of shed photoreceptor outer segments, recycling of retinoids, and production of cytokines. It also needs to mediate the exchange of nutrients between the choroid and photoreceptors, particularly glucose. 
In order to protect itself from reactive oxygen species and preserve glucose for transport, the RPE uses high levels of reductive carboxylation to produce NADPH from NAD+. Studies show that increasing age and oxidative stress depletes NAD+. The next question you might ask is, how do we know that oxidative stress is even related to AMD? Many genes have identified um, as strong risk factors for the development of AMD. Of those, the most promising and most studied are complement factor H and the ARMS2 HGRA1 loci. Although the exact function of these genes in the RPE is unknown, studies suggest that they help protect the RPE from oxidative stress. In this study, looking at CHF, they show that the percentage of viable human iPS cells differentiated into RPE cells after the addition of 4-HNE, which induces reactive oxygen species formation. They then show that cells are rescued by the recombinant full-length CFH. Overall, this suggests that CFH protects against oxidative stress in RPE cells. Uh, this study looks uh, at superoxide dismutase 2 activity in response to oxidative stress in cells with either the protective or the risk alleles of the ARMS2 HCR1 loci. They used A2E in this study to generate singlet reaction oxygen species to simulate oxidative stress. In figure A, they show a significant increase in SOD2 activity for patients with the homozygous GG allele, which is protective but no increase or even a decrease in SOD2 activity with homozygous and heterozygous risk alleles. Figure B shows the antioxidant activity of human RPE cells before and after the addition of A2E. There's an increase here in the antioxidant capacity in response to oxidative stress in RPE cells with protective allele, but a decrease in the risk alleles. This also suggests a protective effect of the gene against oxidative stress. So why do we choose NMN as a supplement? Here's the NAD metabolome. This is NAD plus on the left, and here's NMN on the right. I am just showing this to highlight that NMN is a direct precursor to NAD plus. Nicotinamide riboside, or NR, is also a possible precursor with commercially available supplements. But as you can see, it must first be converted to NMN in the body. This is our rationale behind choosing NMN as our supplement of choice. So is there evidence that NMN is likely to protect the cell from oxidative stress? Well, here in this study, the authors show that NAD plus concentrations are significantly depleted by hydrogen peroxide in human fetal RP cells. They also show that the hydrogen peroxide causes significant cell death. However, supplementing the culture medium with NMN completely prevented the cell death induced by the hydrogen peroxide. And what evidence is there that NMN might be beneficial specifically in AMD? Well, in this study, they looked at the expression of proteins associated with AMD progression in human iPS-derived RP cells from AMD and control patients. They included patients who are homozygous and heterozygous for the ARMS to HGRA1 risk allele and the heterozygous uh, CHF risk allele. Overall, they show higher levels of expression um, in the AMD cell lines compared to the control with decreased expression in these proteins after the addition of NMN to this culture medium. They also looked at multiple other associated proteins showing a similar result. So this is the overall proposed pathway for how oxidative stress, which the RPE cells are particularly sensitive to, eventually leads to RPE cell death. First, oxidative stress causes DNA damage, which acts as PARP. Um, PRP, which is a family of proteins involved in cellular processes such as DNA repair and genomic stability, um, depletes NAD plus to repair DNA. As NAD plus is depleted, SIRT1 activity decreases, um, which is the most conservative mammalian dependent histone deacetylase. The decreased SIRT1 activity causes increased histone acetylation, which loses chromatin and decreases the specialization of RP and increases production of aberrant proteins. The next question is, why FLEO? Studies done by the Bernstein Lab have shown that patients with AMD have a ring-shaped prolongation of the mean fluorescence autofluorescence lifetimes in um, at the fundus autofluorescence lifetime in the long spectral channel. This can be seen even in patients with very early AMD with minimal other findings on imaging. It is possible that this is detecting very early metabolic change in the macula which could potentially be reversible. With this technique, we hope to see real-time changes rather than a long-term progression. And here's the change, the long, spec uh, long spectral channel
prolongation that we're describing. Now that I've laid out the rationale, I'll briefly out the method of uh, methods. This is a prospective pilot study without a placebo control. Given that we already have baseline flail images for patients with early AMD that show stability of the long spectral prolongation, at the time, we did not feel that doing an additional placebo control was necessary for the pilot study. We had an initial recruitment target of 20 subjects, um, and we included any patients greater than 40 years of age with early or intermediate dry AMD that has had cataract surgery in the study eye. We excluded any patients with other macular conditions um, or who did not have the characteristic FLEO pattern. We had five total study visits, one at baseline, then one each at week one, four, eight, and 12, and they all included visual acuity, contrast acuity, slit lamp exam, macular OCT, fundus autofluorescence, and FLEO. This is the NMN product that we used. We used a total of 900 milligrams per day for a total of 12 weeks. And now for the results. We were able to enroll a total of 10 eyes or five subjects. Of those, eight eyes completed the study. One subject dropped out about halfway through the study. She reported mild flushing of the skin on her arms that resolved after stopping the supplement. No other adverse events were reported. Our secondary outcomes of visual acuity and contrast sensitivity remained stable throughout the trial. Here are the FLEO patterns in the LSC of three representative eyes at baseline and at 12 weeks. Qualitatively, we did not see an obvious change in the FLEO pattern. We then analyzed the mean fluorescence lifetimes in the central ring, the inner ring, outer ring, and the full macula as defined by the ETDRS grid. The area between these lines defined the outer ring, which is found to be the area of interest in the prior study. This graphs out the change in the mean fluorescence lifetimes in the long spectral channel over the 12 weeks. There's an overall trend towards an increase in the mean fluorescence lifetimes. And here in this analysis, we use the pair T test to compare the mean fluorescence lifetimes at the 12 week time point with the baseline images for both the LSC and the SSC. This shows a small increase in the mean fluorescence lifetime in the long spectral channel that approaches statistical significance in the, on the two tail T test. There's also an increase in the mean lifetime of the full macula, which is heavily influenced by the outer ring segments. There are no other significant differences between the FLEO measurements from baseline to study completion. Overall, we see a average increase in the prolongation of the mean fluorescent lifetimes in the long spectral channel in the outer ring. We were hoping to see an average decrease in the mean fluorescence lifetimes with NMN supplementation. However, we did not see evidence of this in the study. We previously showed that more advanced AMD is correlated with increased prolongation of the long spectral channel. However, we do not have accurate data measuring this rate of change within an individual. While this confirms that AMD, oh, excuse me, while this confirms that the FLEO pattern in the long spectral channel is the area of interest in AMD, the remaining questions are as follows. Does NMN affect the rate of this prolongation in the long spectral channel? And what is the natural rate of progression of prolongation in AMD patients? So some of the weaknesses of the study include a small patient population, a lack of a control group, and a short study duration. Other weaknesses include the lack of measurements of the serum levels of NMN before and after supplementation. Also, there's not really good clarity on what compounds we're exactly picking up on FLEO. Our next step will be to establish a baseline rate of mean lifetime prolongation in AMD patients to use as a control. This project is already ongoing, and the reason we decided not to enroll control patients for this particular study. However, after analyzing the data that we have in our database of these AMD patients without supplementation, we found that it was not directly comparable to the patients in this study. For this reason, we need to, a more standardized set of control patients. We would also love to increase the enrollment and duration of the study. And a special thanks to Dr. Bernstein for supporting the study. Uh, a big thank you to our resident and FLEO expert, Lydia, who helped me a lot with the data analysis and the project overall. Thank you to Alex Vitali for helping to teach uh, me and the imagers how to use the FLEO, and Marcella for doing all of the FLEO images for all of my patients. Um, our prior resident, Brad Jacobson, helped me uh, find patients to recruit for the study. And finally, a thank you to Elizabeth, Deborah, and Kellyanne. I don't know what to say. I guess the I just keep going, right? Here are some of my references, and... Uh, Thank you for your attention. Any questions I can answer? Marshall, there are two questions that were in the chat. 
uh, one from uh, uh, Judith Warner wanting to know why cataract surgery. And from Kathleen Degree, I think you already answered about the uh, follow-up period. Uh, is it long enough? And you said it was short. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, Judith's so, question. Yeah, so uh, for Dr. Warner's question, we wanted cataract surgery because we found that the lens can significantly affect the, uh, the FLEO imaging. Um, so with patients with different degrees of nuclear sclerosis, it makes it really difficult to compare between patients. But having patients that are pseudophagic, it creates a really nice baseline of comparison for us. Um, so really good question. Um, and uh, in terms of the uh, follow-up time, I, you know, it's hard to know if it's long enough. I would say based on the study, it's not because we're not really seeing significant results. And based on previous studies, such as the ARET2 um, uh, studies, it, it, we would expect to need, um, you know, many more months, maybe years to see a significant effect in macular degeneration, uh, but really hard to know overall. Um, and I do, and with Dr. Petty's questions with the clear lenses versus the Alcon blue blocking lessons uh, affect, affecting FLEO. Um, I'm actually not sure about that. That's a great question. Um, my guess is that the effect would be relatively minimal compared to um, say a crystalline lens, um, but all of our patients here did happen to have clear uh, uh, intraocular lenses put in. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks, Marshall. That was, uh, it's been fun to watch uh, this uh, process and this topic and evolution over time in your presentations. We'll miss hearing about it. <laughs> um, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Fleckenstein. Okay. Please. So with this, uh, we um, go on with our next speaker, Mike Murray. And uh, he will actually do a corner fellowship um, at the University of Colorado in Denver. And um, what you may not know about him, he celebrated his 10th birthday in North America, Utah, his 20th birthday in Europe, Sweden, and his 30th birthday in Tanzania, Africa. And he's actually planning to go on with this tradition and um, let's see where he have been when he's turning 70 and maybe has traveled all the continents. And today um, he will present us uh, the surgical outcomes and demographics of Navajo Nation outreach. Mike, the stage is yours. Okay, I'm unmuted now, I think. Can you all hear yes. me? Yes, wonderful. Perfect. Um, I came down with a little bit of sickness. It's not COVID, uh, but please excuse my voice. It's not going to be uh, as pleasant as my other chief residents. Uh, I'll be presenting on surgical outcomes and demographics in the Navajo Nation outreach. Uh, Moran has been going and providing clinical and surgical care to the Navajo Nation um, at least since 2013. This is a map of the Navajo Nation, which is the largest by area and also by population of all the Native American reservations in the United States. Uh, there are primary locations in Montezuma Creek, Monument Valley, and Navajo Mountain, as you see there and it serves a population of over 170,000 people. Um, there have been really uh, a dearth of studies uh, about the Navajo Nation and about Indian reservation uh, care in general. Uh, two studies that were done in the 80s suggested that trauma might be the number one cause of blindness, um, and they were severely limited by uh, the presentation of patients in those studies, and mostly being in the emergency setting. So there's a big need for um, data analysis and uh, care as well to the Navajo Nation. These are some of the patients uh, that you see uh, down in the Navajo Nation, and they're really so grateful for care. You'll notice Dr. Hoffman over there, even during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we're able to do uh, continue to do clinical and uh, some surgical care as well. Uh, when a patient comes in, uh, and we've had uh, over kind of 2,500 patient visits that we've analyzed in this study, uh, they'll check in and they'll uh, do a visual acuity and their history. If their vision is better than 2040 and they have no concerning history, they're screened out. But if they have poor visual acuity, we'll work on their refraction and see if that takes care of their uh, visual acuity and uh, refracts you know, better to 2020 or, or so. And if not, they're screen into being dilated uh, and checking for other pathologies. 
so our study analyzed um, a bunch of different uh, patients. We screened out about 300 patients, so a total of maybe uh, about 2,200 patients. This was the demographics, um, a maximum age of 92. I remember that patient. She was uh, very, very cute and nice, um, and a female predominance in the clinic. And then you can see from the different sites, uh, Montezuma Creek Monument Valley and Navajo Mountain. Navajo Mountain is more remote area, harder to get to. Uh, the patient histories, there's a high rate of diabetes uh, as well as hypertension, as you can imagine, in uh, this uh, kind of genetic population where they're uh, genetically predisposed to uh, hang on to all of the uh, energy as they've been kind of in the hunter-gatherer stage. And um, trauma is about 4%, hyperlipidemia a little bit lower. Now, we used the visual acuity uh, that was uh, suggested by Bourne et al. And they did a estimate of what the worldwide uh, visual uh, impairment would be. So mild visual impairment would be from 2040 to 2060. Moderate would be from 2060 to 2200. Severe 2200 to 2400. And then blindness rated as worse than 2400. There are high rates of blindness um, in patients both with uh, or without correction. Um, and these are higher than the world estimates. Uh, another interesting finding that we've had, and Dr. Hoffman will tell you that this is uh, true in the adult and pediatric population, is there's a high level of SIL in these patients, uh, especially when you're doing uh, their refractions and in the kids when you're doing retinoscopy. Um, not a high rate of glaucoma in these patients, uh, but we do see some angle closure and uh, some other kind of severe forms of glaucoma. So this is kind of a uh, demographics and uh, a diagnostic table, a uh, high rate of cataracts, um, and then a high rate of refractive error as well. Um, there's obviously a lot of diabetic retinopathy, um, and then you can see uh, the levels of glaucoma, RD, uh, ERM, et cetera. So for these patients, uh, the main causes of blindness, which uh, to remind you, worse than 2,400 vision, um, cataract and refractive error were the highest. Um, then there are several patients with retinitis pigmentosa, diabetic retinopathy, et cetera. Uh, the surgical data, it was actually difficult to analyze. Um, and in going through this data, uh, we realized basically that uh, Keeping better records and having better follow-up uh, for these patients will help us to know a little bit more of our benchmarks. Um, and so preoperative and postoperative visual acuity data was really, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, um, it was really harder to, um, to analyze here, but uh, there was a low rate of uh, PC tear, especially in these complicated cataracts. Um, and then uh, post-epiphema, there were a couple of cases of pterygium maladherence. But overall, I wanted to emphasize with this slide that um, we're providing high-level care uh, to these patients. Sometimes um, in the outreach world, there is a uh, element of distrust in the community that they're going to practice on the native patients. And so this is important data for us to, uh, to publish that we're performing safe surgeries and a good level of uh, complications there. Um, in conclusion, uh, really interesting that 73% of the bilateral blindness in this Navajo Nation cohort uh, was preventable, uh, either through refraction or cataract surgery. And the rate of blindness was uh, six times worse than the worldwide study. Uh, an interesting finding that we found was uh, RP uh, was a lot higher than reported in the US population. And sometimes you might think, oh, this is just because uh, there's one family uh, that is all related, but uh, only two patients uh, of our seven patients were related. And then obviously our data is limited because uh, we are analyzing the patients who are coming to our clinics. Um, however, I do think it's important to note this is the first ever study to report on outcomes uh, in the Navajo Nation and uh, on these presentations. Um, there's a couple of current and future projects that are kind of offshooting from this data. Uh, we're working on a pseudo-exfoliation study uh, working on a pediatrics review. If you saw, there's a Grand Rounds a couple weeks ago where Ryan Wallace talked a little bit about the progress with that study. Um, and then in our surgical outcomes, we're improving our kind of future data entry so that we'll have better analysis 
And then finally, um, we really want to increase capacity in the technicians um, in the Navajo Nation. And so uh, we have a grant and we're working on training the technicians down there to have a high level of uh, knowledge so that they can triage and assist in uh, the care of patients when we're not there. Uh, I just wanted a big thank you to Ryan Wallace. He's been uh, the, I don't know what it's called, but uh, Dr. Chaya's kind of research fellow this past year and has put in a lot of work. Uh, Lori McCoy, Esperon Peralta, and then uh, Teresa, Dr. Petty, Dr. Chaya, Dr. Hoffman for all of their work in the Navajo Nation. Couldn't have done this uh, without all their help. These are uh, some of my references. And then uh, happy to take any questions. Um, thank you. Mike, thank you so much. <laughs> this is so impressive and important work uh, that you and the team are doing. And actually, uh, Jeff Petty is um, commenting, um, a challenge with uh, um, your work is the sampling bias. Patients are um, actually um, coming to the eye clinic more likely to have pathology um, than the population. And how um, should you, or can, can the team consider this when comparing with other population reports? Yeah, I think that uh, the highest tier when you're doing demographics research would be really to get out and to randomly sample the population and go door to door. Um, and it would be amazing to do that type of a study. Uh, we don't at this point have uh, the funding and the means, uh, or at least I haven't been able to do that, but would love to. And you are accurate in that uh, we are biased by the sampling for sure. Um, okay. I had one uh, comment. I, I listed it at the beginning of my slide, but this was done all under the Navajo Nation IRB process. And so uh, they approved uh, the presentation of this data. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Just a quick comment. The, um, the kind of gold standard is, is called a, a, a RAB, stands for a Rapid uh, Assessment of Avoidable blindness. blindness. It is something we've explored uh, doing there, it requires uh, teams actually going, you, you basically, um, you designate geographic areas, uh, and then you can do a random sampling of those geographic areas and then send teams out, but you have to get a certain percentage uh, of the population to be evaluated. It's a very, very limited screening. I mean, it's essentially, you know, visual acuity, uh, kind of limited examination, uh, but enough of an examination to identify the cause of blindness. Um, you know, there haven't been any done in Native American populations. It's a little controversial on whether, you know, it perfectly applies the way it does in, you know, other global settings, but it certainly is the one that, you know, we've been discussing and, and tossing around. So, you know, maybe we'll all be taking a field trip at some point, um, you know, in, in our teams. Stay tuned. Uh, happy to help out with that. It would be it would be amazing uh, to get that data, honestly. So, thank you all. Bob, you proceed. You're still muted. Bob, you're I'm muted. Mute myself. I, I think I'm there now. Mike, that was a wonderful talk. A topic uh, near and dear to my heart, and I appreciate you doing that. Next up, uh, our, we're going to move on now uh, uh, to the. Uh, uh, next year, our, our, our second uh, uh, year residents, uh, Sean Collin, uh, has spent an enormous amount of time on this uh, topic that he's talking to us about, the Utah Assessment Review Community Eye Health Study. But first, I do need to share with you that Sean is apparently thrilled uh, and doesn't think we all know that he's thrilled about a new climbing gym called the Salt Lake Bouldering Project, which is in the Granary District. And uh, I think with that, we may have to go check that out. Um, Dr. Colin. Yeah, so that's a, that's a little plug for, for, this, for this new gym, trying to help them out. Um, <laughs> it may or may not be the inspiration for uh, the, the title of my QI project, but let me share my screen here. Uh, for now, talking about the Arches project. So again, I'm Sean Collin. Can everyone see my screen? Cool. Um, PGY3, second year ophthalmology resident. Uh, and our, uh, we have many people working on this project. The PI is Craig Chat. So this slide is uh, a slide that I showed last year, um, but just wanted to rehash a little bit about needs assessments and qualitative research. 
So uh, qualitative research is generally hypothesis generating research as opposed to most of the research being discussed here today with it, which is hypothesis testing research. Needs assessments uh, are a form of qualitative research and became a requirement for all nonprofit hospitals by the, uh, with the passage of the Affordable Care Act. However, most eye hospitals have been effectively exempt from this requirement, either because they're private for-profit uh, hospitals or because they fall under the larger umbrella of, uh, of uh, an academic center. Will's Eye Hospital is a notable exception, the only exception uh, to my knowledge, and they published their first needs assessment in 2016, published another in 2020, uh, each one being a four-year effort, and those were major inspirations for what we were trying to do are trying to do. So we intentionally asked this very broad question statewide, where are we succeeding and where are we falling short in providing eye care to Utah's most underserved and vulnerable populations? We had a stakeholder kickoff in September of 2020 that I discussed last year. That was really just informal discussions with some of the stakeholders in eye care throughout Utah. Uh, either the day before or the day of Resident Research Day last year, we sent uh, this survey out, a stakeholder survey to 441 stakeholders in primary care, ophthalmology, optometry, administration, public health, et cetera, anyone who we thought might have any sort of vested interest in eye care uh, throughout Utah. Uh, we got the results back from that and sort of looked through it. And then we had a stakeholder focus group in January of this year where we dove a little deeper into some of the things that came up in the survey. Um, so new from last year is the uh, data and the responses from the survey. So we got 61 responses from 441 invites. I think that's actually a little bit better than it sounds um, because we know that many of the surveys were sent to old uh, emails that were no longer in use sort of from the UOS registry. Um, it was also a rather long survey. And so, uh, you know, 61 responses was, was fairly good. We ended up sending out the survey multiple times and, and calling all of the people on our list um, to try and increase that number. But we had good representation within those 61 responses from ophthalmologists, optometrists, and then uh, community care organizations and other healthcare providers. You can see here a map of our responses uh, clustered along the Wasatch Front, but we did have statewide representation and really the distribution of the responses uh, mirrors the population distribution of our state pretty well. Some interesting things from the survey uh, is that greater than 80% of respondents reported that their organization was specifically equipped to provide care for uninsured and underinsured individuals, meaning that they provided free care or financial assistance. Uh, greater than 80% also reported being able to provide care for people with disabilities and for non-English speaking people. Further, excluding ophthalmologists and optometrists, all but one respondent rank vision health as important or a central focus. Obviously, we would expect that ophthalmologists and optometrists would rank it as a central focus. But so knowing these things, the question remains, you know, if we have clinics that are uh, capable of taking care of these patients and, uh, um, and, and, and it's, a, it's a reasonably high priority, why is it not happening? We asked a couple more questions. So what should be the, the top priorities for eye care in Utah? Um, and in this regard, diabetic retinopathy screening care came out on top. Vision screening for children and access to glasses and corrective lenses was close behind. We also asked our stakeholders uh, what they perceived to be the greatest patient barriers to receiving eye care. By far, cost of care was the most commonly cited barrier. Lack of insurance uh, was also commonly cited and goes hand in hand with cost of care. And then cost of missing work or income to attend appointment was next. But I think that the, the fourth one here on this list is actually something that ended up coming up quite a bit in, in comments and in the focus group. And that is knowledge and awareness of eye disease among patients. So we had our stakeholder focus group in January of this year. It was about 10 participants. We sort of asked everyone who responded to the survey if they'd be willing to participate. Uh, and again, we had pretty good representation from ophthalmologists, optometrists, um, uh, health practitioners from, you know, in, in the primary care setting in community clinics, 
Um, and a few things that came up, first of all, we have many willing eye care providers in the community. One of the respondents stated that he was uh, willing and able to see anyone who came through his door, regardless of their ability to pay. And also that he knew that uh, other providers in his area were, were also equipped to do that. Um, at uh, larger academic institutions, uh, some people reported that although they felt like they're, they, they, they had knew that there was a way to provide subsidized care, uh, it was a little bit more difficult. They didn't really know how to provide uh, subsidized clinical care. Um, and further, the ancillary testing was very difficult and, and free care was not possible. They did mention though that uh, providing surgical care or surgical care was quite available for uninsured and underinsured patients. So that was a major strength. As far as our community clinics that were providing primary care, most of the providers there expressed this feeling of, of just not having anywhere to send patients. So in some of the rural areas like Moab, um, there's you know one eye care provider within an hour and they are known not to take patients who don't have insurance. Uh, in some of the more urban areas, um, you know, free clinics and fairly qualified health centers rely on uh, services that are that are intermittently available that uh, move locations, and uh, they just express you know when they have a patient who needs eye care, it's very very hard to figure out where to send them. And then finally, something that kept coming up is that patients uh, don't really see the value in eye care screening. One um, practitioner from a community clinic said that with regards to their teleophthalmology program, patient's response was, well, if it's free, why not? No patient ever said, uh, yeah, I really need to you know, have my eyes checked. So patient education is lacking and a lot of folks mentioned ways that we could meet people where they are, educate them, screen um, you know, where patients are. So point of care screening at, at primary care appointments, uh, educational material at libraries, uh, educating our own schedulers and receptionists to be able to give patients options when the question of how much an appointment will cost come up, and then educating school nurses and teachers to make sure the kids are getting the, the plugged into the resources that are available. Our takeaway is, uh, you know, we had a lot of people calling for better collaboration, and, and this really seems, I, I guess it seems, seems obvious, but even more so after sort of the responses, recognizing that we have willing providers, we have patients who need providers. And so large strides can probably be made just by connecting those patients with the willing providers. Uh, patient education is something that kept coming up uh, and another place where you know relatively low cost interventions could have um, significant returns. And then we also recognize that within our own study group and within our pool of respondents, uh, we did not have a very diverse um, group and uh, going forward in this study, we'd like to more actively seek out uh, voices and opinions uh, of um, people who identify as black, indigenous, people of color, uh, and in general to uh, sort of seek out minority voices and opinions. Our next steps here uh, are to connect eye care providers and community clinics through a referral network database online. I think this is one of the most important things that we can do um, to, you know, without creating any new resources, just to tap into what's available. And at the same time, we're working on implementing point of care screening through teleophthalmology at many of these community clinics throughout the state. I'll talk about that a little bit later on uh, with my quality improvement project. Several other steps that we'd like to take in the near future um, with regards to this needs assessment, uh, but I'll leave it there for now and open it up to any questions if anyone has any. Sean, Sean I, I you know, have, have a comment and, and a question for you. Uh, yeah. So you know, one of the fundamental questions we have to answer in our building is what, what role do we take well, when we have limited resources? You know, what, are, what are the essential you know, how, how does Moran fit into the puzzle of providing unfunded care? Is it primarily as a, as a, a facilitator, as a providing care, et cetera, and a little bit of background. Providing free clinical care is relatively simple for all the providers throughout the state. Uh, establishing a free eye clinic is relatively simple. 
compared to providing surgery. Actually, surgery, most of the time as you look around the country, surgery is the 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 kind of orphan area of care where, yeah, you can diagnose, 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 but there's really no pathways or avenues for surgery. And so that's where, you know, 11 years ago, uh, that was really the reason with Brian Stagg, you know, Brent Price and others that we really leaned into, let's, let's provide surgical care as something unique that we can do in the community, both because one, we can, but two, we can provide a, a pretty broad spectrum of care as well for people that need it. And so now as you consider the rest of the state and really leaning into the clinical care, you, know, you mentioned the need for a better collaboration. Does that mean that you know, Moran Eye Center becomes the entity that provides that? Is that something that needs to frankly come down through the state government? Uh, you know, the Utah Ophthalmology Society, we know well, but short of them uh, cooperating with Utah Optometric Society, you know, that's only going to go so far. So you know, in the, you know, you're the wizard, Sean, you can, you, you can create whatever system you want. What, what is the entity that really needs to be that central collaborator? And what would your recommendations for next steps be? I, I well, I think there needs to be a central collaborator, but, and, and, and perhaps that is the Moran or Moran outreach, but that does not mean that the Moran or Moran outreach can or should be providing, um, even even a, a majority of the care, maybe maybe even should be providing less care. We should be maybe tapping into even more the resources in the community that are available. So, um, I, and and as far as I can tell right now, it seems like it's going to be a very manual effort, calling clinics one by one, talking with physicians there, and saying what can you do for patients without insurance uh, who have Medicaid? Can you see them? You know, will you see them? How many will you see? And then creating a database. Uh, that is accessible to community clinics where they can go and see the providers in their area that are willing to, uh, to, to provide care for their patients and what that might look like for their patients. Um, to me, that's, that's what I see as being the, the ultimate way of doing things. I think there's, I think state funding would be great and very helpful. Um, but there's just, it, things are so scattered, uh, even getting into things as, as rudimentary as, as EHR integration and sharing of information, it's so difficult to do that just having a resource for clinics to know, okay, here are the places that you can reliably send a patient um, and, and forcing them to rely less on, you know, twice a year screening events or mobile vans that travel around. Um, I, I see that as being uh, the most promising route forward. And, and if we don't have time, Bob, you can cut me off with this. Maybe this will be just a rhetorical question, you know, playing devil's <laughs> advocate. You know, so so on some level, I agree, Sean, because we have the footprint we do and, and the prominent place in the state, I think we are perhaps the path of least resistance or most likely entity to be able to provide some of that. Uh, however, you know, all the surroundings, most of the surrounding states don't have an academic eye center, which then begs the question, you know, sh should the academic eye center be the one to do this or should should this be something that really does come down through something more central through state government? Um, and of course, once we get to should, you know, should patients be uninsured in our country? Um, I understand it can go on and on, but that, that's a question that I continually ask is really what's the fundamental role we should have? Uh, and in this, in a sense, you know, how do, how do we, you know, facilitate that, not just in Utah, but even in Idaho and others where they don't have academic centers. Jeff, we will look, look forward to more discussion on that, that, that topic. Uh, Sean, uh, I'm really impressed with all the time and effort you've put into this project. Uh, you're to be commended on that. That was, uh, you know, you've done a good job. So our next uh, speaker is Cole Swiston. Um, um, very interesting about Cole is that he worked for the National Park Service and part of his job was pumping out houses on random islands. Um, and uh, today uh, he will talk uh, to us about outcomes for combined up interno canaloplasty with hydrous microstent. Cole, it's your Great. Can see this and hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so the big pump they use to pump out these outhouses is called a honeypot, and they have it on barges between islands. So there's been 
times at 2 a.m. on call that I've, you know, told myself at least I'm not running the honey pot right now. And so I'm going to talk today about kind of a unique cohort of patients who have underwent a combination MIGS procedure at the Moran. Uh, and MIGS is minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, which has been all the rave lately as it's uh, less invasive than conventional incidental surgery and is also conjunctival sparing. And there's been some particular interest in uh, combining ab internal canaloplasty, which is pictured up here in the video, where a small microcatheter is uh, inserted through a goniotomy and then uh, threaded through Schlem's canal and then withdrawn, uh, ejecting viscoelastic, thereby dilating Schlem's canal as well as the distal collector channels. Um, that combined with a trabecular meshwork bypass stent, such as an eye stent or a hydrus, uh, has been done with the hopes of conferring additional IOP lowering benefit. Um, and also it's done because the goniotomy as well as the dilation of the canal with the ABIC device does facilitate placement of the stent. However, we don't have any uh, data proving that we should be doing this. So our main question is, should we actually be doing uh, canaloplasty in our hydrus patients and does it confer additional IOP lowering benefit and reduction of medication burden? And so to do that, you obviously need two cohorts. You need your uh, hydrus alone, or in this case, the cataract surgery and hydrus, as well as the ABIC hydrus cohort. So we're going to focus on uh, cohort two today because we do have preliminary data for that group of patients at the Moran. And this data has also not been previously published. And so to identify these patients, we looked at CBT codes over the last five years and then did a retrospective chart view looking at IOP data and medication use throughout 12 months of follow-up. We excluded any pediatric patients or VA patients, and then those with prior incisional IOP lowering surgery, SLT within six months, or anyone who was uh, using steroids or had another IOP complicating diagnosis during that follow-up. And so here are the numbers from those CPTs. Again, we're going to focus on the ABIC hydrus uh, group right now. There were 134 patients who underwent this procedure at the Moran since 2017. And we had primary outcomes, including IOP reduction at each follow-up period, and then IOP lowering medication use at 12 months compared to baseline. We kind of also uniquely uh, applied a linear mixed effects model looking at a number of variables, including the type of device, so ITRAC versus Omni, as well as intersurgeon variability, the number of degrees cannulated with the ABIC device, and then accounting for within eye correlation using a patient eye random effect. We also collected rates of complications and the need for any repeat surgery. So here are our um, kind of just descriptive numbers. After applying occlusion criteria, we had 74 eyes. The majority of those patients underwent uh, eye tract canalplasty with Dr. Chaya. The majority of these were primary open angle glaucoma, though there are a, a couple of different secondary glaucoma types. And about a third of these patients ended up uh, meeting the 12 month follow-up period as we're still early on with this cohort. And so jumping right into the primary outcome, I'm gonna stratify this by device type. This talk is not meant to compare eye track to Omni, but I do think it's useful to just look at them separately. And so this is uh, IOP and the graph on the left here is A, that's an average IOP at each follow-up point. And then B is just reduction from baseline. So kind of a different way to look at the same data. You can see there was a stained IOP lowering effect for eye track that was, um, sustained throughout the follow-up period. And then that reduction from baseline was about 3.5 to four with a little bit of decreased um, efficacy at the 12 month follow-up period. And then Omni, the device is kind of pictured here. Uh, again, statistically significant decrease in IOP compared to baseline at each follow-up period. And that was also sustained in about the five millimeters of mercury to seven range throughout the 12 months. Then looking at medication use, uh, we used a Wilcox and sign rank test at 12 months compared to baseline. And while this was not a statistically significant decrease, we did see a, a hard decrease in the number of IOP lowering medications from 2.6 to 2.3. The complication rate was very low, 2.7% with one psychodialysis cleft in the Omni group and one hyphema, both of which spontaneously resolved. Uh, and then the need for additional surgery was also low at 4.1% over the span of 12 months. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve here on the right that shows kind of the timing of those additional surgeries. And then applying the linear mixed effects model, we did not show any uh, significant intersurgeon variability. Um, 
And there was a significant reduction in IOP regardless of the degrees cannulated. So either 180, 270, or 360. And then we did not see like a dose dependent uh, response. So for any additional degrees, you did not have any additional IOP lowering benefit. Uh, and then, like I said, we're not comparing the devices today, but using this model, there was overall no significant difference in IOP reduction between the two devices. So just kind of a summary, we do have now preliminary, preliminary data demonstrating safety and then a modest IOP lowering effect of the combined ABIC hydrus procedure, which was sustained at 12 months, about 17% IOP reduction in the ITRAC group, and then 38% with Omni, though that was uh, limited by sample size. Overall, no significant difference between these devices given that low sample size with the Omni group. About 96% of these patients did not need additional surgery over that 12 month follow-up period. And I, I don't wanna draw premature conclusions from this um, study comparing it to existing literature. You know, the, the main study we have on Hydrus alone is the Horizon study. And there were significant differences between that and our study here, number one, the horizon was a prospective study. And as such, all of the medications were washed out prior to applying the intervention. So that uh, cohort had a higher baseline IOP. It was also a homogeneous glaucoma population with POAG only, whereas our retrospective study is a variety of glaucoma diagnoses. And they followed patients for 24 months. We are uh, still young with our cohort and at about 12 months at this point, but we'll certainly continue to follow them. We're also limited by sample size, as I mentioned, less Omni patients than ITRAC. There's an ongoing study called the MAGIC trial, which is the multicenter ab internal glaucoma study investigating canaloplasty, uh, which actually seeks to answer the question, uh, which device uh, lowers IOP more with 360 degrees of canaloplasty. So our next step obviously is to uh, look at that cohort number one, which is Hydrus alone, and then compare it to the ABIC Hydrus group. We're in the data review phase for that right now, and we will continue to follow this cohort over time. Specifically, I'd like to thank Dr. Chaya, Dr. Danford, as well as Ryan Wallace, who's our future Baylor Ophthal resident, and then Bryce and Christian, who are medical students. We're trying to convince them to go into ophthalmology, as well as Ben Brins, who is our statistician for this. Uh, happy to take any questions as well. Thank you so much, Cole. Are there any comments or questions? So Dr. Zabriski raised his hand. Would you unmute yourself, please? It's not letting me unmute. Yes, there no, 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 no. Oh, Thank you. Okay, sorry. No, thanks. Uh, Paul, that was a great talk and um, great talk. And I just wanted to just make one comment. You know, the thing that I think I like so much about this study is that it's our patients. You know, I've always argued so much that in these glaucoma surgeries, there's such nuance between populations. And while, you know, while maybe this doesn't compare exactly to the Horizon trial, I almost say, well, well, who cares? You know, I mean, this is our patients. This is our cohort. And it provides so much information that is so helpful about what may or may not work in our patients. And so while these huge multicenter trials like Horizon are great for kind of establishing efficacy in general, these types of studies that uh, establish efficacy in our patients is, is just, are just super important. So congratulations, it was a super helpful study and will continue to be as you, as you, you know, follow your other cohorts and follow them longer term. Very risky. I think uh, while Dr. Stagg unmutes as well, to answer Marshall's question um, with the MAGIC trial being omni-goniotomy versus eye track, I, I looked everywhere to find if that's actually the case. And actually on clinicaltrials.gov, it says 360 canaloplasty omni versus eye track. So if anyone knows the actual answer to that, I'd be happy to hear it. Cole, you ready? Sure. Uh, so I just wanted to first make sure I understood. So all of these patients got the canaloplasty plus the hydrus. Correct. Did you consider, have you looked at our patients that got just canaloplasty or just hydrus? And did you consider comparing those? So that's, that's the next step is we have all the CPTs for hydrus alone. Um, we have to sift out eye stents. And so we're gonna end up comparing hydrus to abic hydrus. 
Uh, actually, Abigail Jebaraj with a team of medical students is reviewing uh, ABIC alone, kind of stratified by device. So eventually we will we'll be able to compare all three cohorts as well. Nice. Some Something that confuses me that you might be able to comment on is like every study I've ever seen about any of these MIGS procedures, it's always like it's the same results. It's like three points lowering on average. And it's like whatever you do, like, you know, like the hook dual blade, like anything, like you like touch the angle and you get this same result basically is what it seems like to me. Do you have any thoughts about that? You know, I, it, are you talking about like even the randomized trials too, or are a lot of those just the retrospective ones? I think you got muted again. I, so what I've seen in a lot of these retrospective MIG studies is they're, they're still uh, medicated post-operative patients. So I, I guess my guess would be, it seems like regardless of the medications used, the clinician just always seems to um, settle on about what they need. So maybe that ends up being three or four millimeters of mercury. I'm, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, anyway, thank you. Thank you, really interesting presentation. I'm excited to see those comparisons. That's a great idea. Sorry, one comment about that, you know, Brian, I think that uh, what you just said is the single most important thing that makes all the MIGs have shown us, and that is the floor effect, you know, this, this episcleral venous pressure, you know, this black box term that's just tagged on to the Goldman equation, you know, which gives us intraocular pressure. Uh, it, we just don't understand that, but we know that regardless of what we do to the angle with MIGs, that is always there, it's always untouched, and it just doesn't allow us to get the pressure below about 14 or 15, it, no matter what the procedure is. So if you want to go lower than that, you got to bypass episcleral venous pressure, which means you got to do a subconjunctival procedure, you know, TRAB or XAN or whatever you want. That's the only, there's, there's just no other way. We've, we've shown that again and again and again. Nice. Thank you. Thank you, Cole. So there's much more discussion ongoing in the chat. So please have a look as well. Uh, thank you all for this great discussion. And uh, Bob, please. Go yes. On. So moving on, we're going to move into our first year resident contingent. First up is Tyler Etheridge. Um, you may think when you talk to Tyler that he's from around here and has spent his life here, but he actually, if you talk to him, has lived uh, in many different places around the world and worked. Um, and I'd urge you at all to talk to him about it at some point. It's actually very interesting. Um, Tyler's going to talk to us about the uh, about asymptomatic ocular injuries associated with orbital fractures. Dr. Etheridge. Thank you very much. Let me. Is everyone able to see my screen? Not yet. Not We're yet. still seeing you. You are a co host, so you should be able to. You got gotcha. you. Okay. All right, I'll swap screens here. Okay, so uh, I'll be presenting on the incidence and severity of asymptomatic ocular injury in adult and Oh, okay. There. Um, uh, in adult and pediatric orbital fractures, I have no conflicts of interest. Um, so the necessity and timing of ophthalmology evaluation and the setting of orbital fractures is currently under debate. The most common practice pattern in the United States being immediate ophthalmology referral. However, in 2009, uh, Melma et al. performed a retrospective study uh, evaluating the incidence of severe ocular injury in visually asymptomatic patients with an orbital fracture. They included 126 patients, 46 of whom were visually asymptomatic. And of those asymptomatic patients, zero had severe ocular injury requiring immediate or uh, ophthalmology evaluation. So the authors uh, concluded that visually asymptomatic patients with an orbital fracture do not have severe ocular injuries requiring emergent evaluation by ophthalmology. 
However, the study was performed uh, at a level two trauma center. Uh, they had a relatively small sample size and they only included routine orbital fractures, whatever that means. Um, we, so we sought to evaluate the presence and severity of ocular injury in visually asymptomatic adult and pediatric orbital fractures here at the University of Utah and Primary Children's Hospital. We performed a retrospective chart review uh, on approximately 2,500 orbital fracture patients over the last 10 years. Of those, about 1,500 were evaluated by ophthalmology during their index hospitalization and were included in the study. Ocular injuries were reviewed and categorized into severe, uh, requiring emergent evaluation, uh, moderate, requiring urgent evaluation, usually within one to two days, and then mild, uh, potentially not requiring evaluation by ophthalmology, at least uh, in that week. Patient symptoms, mechanism of injury, visual acuity, orbital fracture characteristics were all recorded, and we compared the presence or absence of visual symptoms the mechanism of injury and the visual acuity with injury severity. The majority of our patients were between the ages of 20 and 40. Most were males and most were Caucasian. Falls, assault, and motor vehicle accidents were some of the most common mechanisms of injury. There are some very interesting mechanisms such as plane crashes, paragliding injuries, uh, and equestrian injuries. Uh, patients uh, were evaluated by ophthalmology within uh, one day of diagnosis. Nearly half of our patients were hospitalized, and 2% of those who were hospitalized uh, unfortunately passed away during that index hospitalization secondary to the traumatic injuries they suffered. After categorizing patients into those who were visually asymptomatic versus symptomatic, we observed that visually asymptomatic patients were more likely to have a lower severity of ocular injury into the mild and moderate categories. However, about 19% of our patients were unable to report the presence of symptoms, most commonly because they were intubated and sedated. We observed that gunshot wounds were highly associated with severe ocular injury. And interestingly, falls were associated with a lower severity of injury. However, the, those results did not quite reach statistical significance. Finally, we saw that better visual acuity was associated with a lower severity of ocular injury as one might expect. In conclusion, uh, visually asymptomatic patients were less likely to have severe ocular injury However, a significant number of patients were unable to express the presence of symptoms. The mechanism of injury, specifically gunshot wounds and poor visual acuity were associated with higher injury severity. Finally, prospective studies assessing the necessity and timing of ophthalmology evaluation in the setting of orbital fractures are required. For future directions, we hope to continue to develop orbital fracture protocols for the University of Utah, like the one uh, outlined here, uh, which we have established with Primary Children's Hospital based on these data, as well as other studies. Here are some of my references. There are many people to acknowledge for these works, uh, including Deborah Harrison, Elizabeth Newtall, and Dr. Marks. Given that this is Resident Research Day, I thought I would share uh, a brief story in the remaining time that I have. Um, and this is on advice for those who hope to pursue a career in academia from one of the giants in the field of oncology, Donald Coffey. If you don't know his story, it's rather inspiring. He went from failing out of college to being a PhD scientist at Johns Hopkins. Towards the end of his career, he gave his students what was entitled the real final exam, which is outlined here. I'll read some of the excerpts from this that I think are most potent. He states, I have no more insight into science than many others. I was just naive enough to list the obvious to which most of us are blinded because of measurements by false yardsticks and examples which are always in vogue. I know that with time, you can expand and improve on your list. Number one is, if this is true, what does it imply? This is referring to the results of your data. Number two, generate more than one concept to explain your data. 
then give all possible possibilities equal attention and effort. Number three, you don't have to assume anything that you can prove. Number four, the experiment that didn't come out the way you thought it would is the only experiment that is really going to teach you something new. Number five, every datum is screaming to tell you something, but you must do the listening and the thinking. Number six, what you are thinking about while you are coming to work determines your real interest and will direct your accomplishments for the day. Number seven, a complex experiment is usually the least productive. Number eight, it's time to do some experiments. Others must wait. Number nine, you are going to be surprised by the simplicity and beauty of the real answer. Number 10, all new ideas are resisted by you, authorities, editors, study sections, department chairmen, peers, and friends. If this discourages you, you should retire early. However, most criticism can be constructive if you listen with an open mind. Number 11, a good paper is simple, clear, and to the point. Number 12, if two good investigators disagree and a paradox exists, most of their data are both of the data are probably correct, and we just need a new explanation that encompasses both observations. Number 13, give everyone credit. Number 14, do not be fooled by the authority of the printed page. Number 15, many bright people are paralyzed by negative thinking. And number 16, the most important ingredients are honesty, desire, clear thinking, confidence, and hard work. In conclusion, if you are lucky, the world will be paying you a modest salary for what you consider your hobby. And in turn, you will be contrib contributing to some important answers for our present and future society. If you teach and lead, you will amplify your efforts and those of others. And if appropriate, the influence will continue after you cease. Questions? That's a great job, Tyler. Do you think that, um, you know, in, in terms of who to evaluate, it'd be safe to say that if we can't sort out that a patient is asymptomatic, we should take a look at them? Absolutely. Um, a significant percentage, I believe 27% of those who were not able to report symptoms had severe ocular injuries, such as globe rupture, entrapment, retrobulbar hemorrhage, leading to orbital compartment syndrome. I think the biggest um, issue that I have with NOMA at all study is that they didn't even address the fact that you may not be able to extract uh, whether or not somebody has symptoms. And then they also included routine orbital fractures. I don't know what that means. Uh, I think every, every orbital fracture is different. Um, and as our data shows, you can't really predict the severity of injury based solely on the mechanism of injury. And for anybody who's uh, taking call uh, and taking call from the emergency department, our visual acuity and their visual acuity often is in disagreement. So I think that's unreliable as well. All right. Other questions? That was a great talk and it's an important topic. Well, if there are none, thank you. Um, and Thanks, we're gonna move on. Uh, Okay, so Tony May um, he shared with us that um, in another life he could see himself um, in being a massage therapist. <laughs> and this is obviously one of his hobbies he always respected and enjoyed. So uh, today, um, Dr. May is talking about Moran's 2020 re-detachment rates for primary retinal detachments, laying the ground for future QI projects. Take it away. All right, let me start sharing my screen here. All right, now can everyone see this? Yes. Perfect. So, my name is Tony Mai. I'm a second year uh, PGY2, first year um, ophthalmology resident. And my talk's going to be about Moran's 2020 retinal redetachment rate. So, First, what is a retinal redetachment? And this is one of the terms I've found in which the primary failure is when the attachment could not be accomplished during the surgery, but the secondary failure is when there's a detachment after a period 
of attachment after that surgery. And the secondary failure is what we're going to be looking at today. And this could be before six weeks post-op, and this is for an early redetachment, or after six weeks post-op, considered a late redetachment. There are a couple of risk factors that can lead to redetachment after a surgery, mostly proliferative retinopathy. As you can see here on the picture, there's uh, scarring, there's membranes contracting the retina. There can also be large retinal breaks, coral detachment, hypotony, high myopia, a delay in surgery from the symptom onset to the time that the surgery is done. And lastly, ineffective closure, um, where perhaps a surgical technique isn't good enough or something happened during the surgery, like complication that precluded um, a primary or good anatomical outcome. So the study that gave us our um, uh, inspiration to look at this was the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary, Infirmary Quality and Outcomes Report that they publish every year. And the one that we looked at was the 2020 report. This is for the entire Department of Ophthalmology and they report um, multiple outcomes for different departments. And the one that we looked at mostly was the primary retinal detachment reattachment rate. So they flipped it and did a reattachment instead of a reattachment rate, but it's pretty much the same thing. And so for their study, they included pars plantar ventrectomy, sclerobuchal, and pneumatic retinopexy. And they wanted to look at only primary re um, retinal detachment. And so they excluded pediatric patients, chronic RDs, and other things that would um, be a secondary RD, like exudative, tractional, things that had proliferative vitreo retinopathy, if there was a history of macular hole or trauma or previous um, surgery, or if they also had Marfan's or Stickler syndrome. What they looked at was attachment between three to five months post-op. And based on the definition that I proposed earlier, this would be more late uh, redetachments. So this is the chart that they had in their report and their latest number in that red box in the gray column is 89%, which means that in post-op month three to five, 89% of patients were still attached for primary RDs. And I want you to look at the international benchmark that they have here and that's this gray shaded box behind the colored columns. They did a literature review of five studies, and these five studies had outcomes for PPV, sclerobuchal, and pneumatic retinopexy, at least two out of three of those. And they made a range out of those, and that was anywhere between 59.4% to 95% for being attached after the surgery. Now, I went into these studies myself and looked at it. And they had a lot of variations. They did not have the same exclusion criteria as uh, Massachusetts Eye and Ear had, if anything, a lot less, where they included as many patients as they could and did not have very good um, uh, specific time frames for looking at whether they were attached or detached three or five months post-op. It was more of a, um, a broad study. So the question now is, how does Moran compare? And I like this term that was suggested by Dr. Levin, quality research project, in, in that it is a combo between quality improvement and a research study in that we are still looking at Moran's data here, hoping to find some way to improve ourselves and see what our benchmark is. But in order to do so, we need to do a bit of a research study to find that out first. So this project was designed with the help of Matt Ba speaking with him on how do we best capture these patients. He told me that the best way to do that was using CPT codes because we can find the exact date that the patients had a renal detachment repair. And then also if they had a repair within the six months after, and that would be very difficult to do just using a diagnosis code. We included the pars plantar vitrectomy, sclerobuchal pneumatic retinopexy, similar to Harvard's study, but we also added cryo and laser retinopexy. Just for completeness, these were the CBT codes that we used. And for our exclusion criteria, we used the same that was used in the Harvard study, but 
also, but uh, also added other entities like PDR, severe glaucoma, infection, uveitis, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, as well as complications in the initial PPV or tears or holes that were repaired, but did not actually have a true retinal detachment. So as a summary for the design differences, uh, our Moran study included cryo and laser while the Harvard study did not. We also expanded the exclusion criteria to take things out that had a lot of infection, uveitis, PDR, glaucoma, and the such like I had in the last slide. For our primary outcome, we looked at if there was detachment within the entire six-month post-op while the Harvard study only looked between three and five months. And we did this because we also wanted to include patients that had early redetachment too, while theirs did not. So I just want to um, put a disclaimer out that the following is just preliminary data only, so please take it with a grain of salt, uh, like I have been doing myself. I just finished this just a week ago, so this is still gonna be undergoing review with the retina department and figuring out how we can um, best um, improve the accuracy of the data. So the CPT codes that were uh, done by the Epic query with Matt Bob turned out 30, 322 patients that had those procedures done in 2020. We ran those through the exclusion criteria with chart review retrospectively, and that turned out 90 patients with primary RDs after um, we had excluded these patients, which were 232, out of which 47, the majority of them, had retinal holes or tears, but without a true RD. And the rest ranged from having traumatic RDs to chronic RDs, um, proliferative uh, diabetic retinopathy with tractional RDs or pediatric patients. And there was a lot of overlap between these also. Now, these 90 patients with primary RDs, 28 of them had redetachment surgery within six months. And so if we were to put a simple fraction where the, re the ones needing redetachment was on the numerator and the total primary RDs was in the denominator, this turns out to be a rate of 31% for uh, primary rental detachments. So just comparing this with the previous data that we've seen, the gray box there is the international benchmark and Moran's number is on the higher end of it, still within the benchmark but on the higher side compared to the MEI study that we use for inspiration, which was right around 11%. But I do want everyone to remember that our it's not directly comparable because there were some differences in our design in that Moran included more um, procedures. We expanded the exclusion, exclusion criteria. And then we also counted all read attachments within six months post-op. All of these reasons could be contributing to the difference in the rate that you're seeing. Now, still, I want to take a step back here and reevaluate the approach to getting this number, because even this number, looking at myself, I did raise an eyebrow a little bit and ask myself, am I doing things correctly? So these are a couple of the areas that I can see where we can investigate a little bit further and find out if the approach was actually uh, correct. So first is the EPIC query, where... I can ask myself, are we missing people by just using the CPT codes? Was that method correct in the first place? I know just by going through the data that very few patients, VA patients were captured and working at the VA myself, there were many more retinal detachments and retinal tears and holes that were repaired at the Moran that were not captured just using this method. Um, so I'll hopefully be working with the billing and the retina department on finding ways where we can improve this. Next is our inclusion and exclusion criteria. I know that we tried to revamp the exclusion criteria by adding more and added more surgeries just for our own um, future projects, but should we also modify the criteria to copy uh, the Harvard study so we can directly compare to the number that they have? And lastly, just data collection itself, there was a lot of tedious chart review in this process, and so, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of human error that I myself probably had made. And so I would need to go through this data again to make sure that it's accurate and hopefully involve someone else to also go through it to have a second pair of eyes. All of this returning a perhaps a better redetachment rate that we can trust. 
So our next steps here is to review the project design and methods with the retina department and the billing department. Uh, I'll need to review the data to ensure accuracy and also involve someone else to review it alongside me. Uh, if all of these turn out to be satisfactory, then we can stratify the redetachment rates for individual procedures and then compare that with the literature. And then we can plot the redetachment time course um, based on which month they're happening in and perhaps if there's any correlation with the particular type of procedure. And then lastly, dive deeper into what is causing the redetachment, whether that's PBR or surgical technique or something else that's there that we're perhaps missing. So at the end, if Moran's reattachment rate is truly that number, my question is how can we improve? And I think this is a great project to lay the foundation for looking at uh, future QI efforts and how we can bring this number down if that's what it is, or if the number is different, what can we do to improve our approach for other departments to use this same kind of retrospective uh, review looking at surgical issues. And the contributors are Hong Gam Lei, she's our retina fellow who helped, helped me, helped lead me through this project. Dr. Jacoby, who is our lead. Uh, and Amika Hansen, who is a medical student who helped a little bit on some of the data collection. And Matt Bauch, who helped with the design of the CPT codes and Epic query. And I'll be taking any questions. Thank you, Tony. Um, thank you so much for this preliminary data, which of course is very, very important to us. And so Joe Simonet um, has the first question. Thanks, Tony, for taking on this really complicated uh, subject. I have one question about Harvard's data and one question about our data. So I'll just ask them both. For Harvard's, for that three to five month range, so how would they code like a case that detached month one and then had repeat surgery and then was re then was attached through months three and five, which would be like the majority or almost all detachments related to pneumatic retinopexy. Those usually happen pretty early. So that's my question about Harvard's data. Exactly. And then our data, uh, can you just speak to kind of why, I guess, just retinopexy, laser retinopexy and cryopexy were included since we almost exclusively do that just for breaks. The, the rare occasion, occasions we would do that for a detachment would be like to barricade a peripheral detachment. And I guess technically that's not really repairing the detachment. So I was just kind of curious about how many cases you included from those CPT codes and, and, and what the reason was for including those cases. Thanks. Yeah, great questions. So for the Harvard study, uh, that's, one of the questions I had for them too, what happened if something came first and was stay, stayed attached? And the honest answer is I'm not sure because they did not fully explain their, their methods very well. This was more of a public report where it was a report for all the departments and it was more results-based. And they didn't really get into the weeds of what their thought process was for each particular little study that they had in that quality and outcomes report. So honestly, I'm not too sure either. Uh, as for our own data, we included the laser and the cryo um, just for completeness because we were thinking that we might be looking at these for future projects, not necessarily this particular retinal redetachment, but in case we wanted to do things looking at just tears also, then we can go back and have these patients here. Okay, we have one comment from uh, Judith Warner. Uh, were these only cases that came to the OR? Did you cross check with the yellow sheets? Yes, and so these were not only cases that came to the OR because we just did CPT codes. We also were able to capture patients that were repaired in clinic um, or after hours when um, someone came to the ED and the retina fellow came and did a pneumatic and um, repaired their RD. And so, and cross-checking with the yellow sheets was difficult because we felt like the yellow sheets wasn't complete at this time. Only about 20 came back for the yellow sheets, which was definitely a lower number than uh, we expected for the amount of ORs and retinal detachments, just procedures that we had in clinic. So maybe Brian Stagg, a last quick question, and then please look into the chat. There's a lot of discussion going on. Yeah, I'll be quick. Just wanted to say this is a great project and uh, measuring quality is super hard and comparing quality between places is super hard because there's so many things that go into it, like 
case mix and definitions and all that. And I, I think you were kind of talking about that. Something that you said at the end that I really liked, that I think is a really important area is, uh, I, I think the absolute rate of complication matters less than the change in rate of the, or not of complication, but of outcome. So the change in rate matters more. So I think what you're doing to measure the, the rate of read attachment is really important, not so much to compare us to other places, um, but to like make improve, like the continuous improvement. So I liked how you talked about like targeting doing that. And I think, I, I was just wondering if you had thoughts about that, like um, how you might target to improve, like reduce read attachments besides, you know, just changing the definition over time or like changing who you take, but like, what, what could you do about that? And have you thought about like measuring that as a study? Uh, yeah, so that is one of my further down the line thoughts because I won't even trust that the data I'm getting is a good in the first place. So that's the first step, but yeah, you're right. The second step is figuring out ways where we have actionable items where we can improve that uh, reattachment rate. And I think to do that, we need to figure out what's causing it in the first place. So during the data collection, I did collect some of the reasons why these reattachments are having, say like it's PVR or something else. It will be difficult because a lot of times in those notes, there's not a good documentation of why the reattachment happened. It'll just say PVR or there was a new detachment and it's a little bit mysterious for me as for uh, why these things are occurring. And so that will be probably a QI project or another study on what's going on in that place. Then we can figure out how to fix it. Thank you so much all for the discussion. Again, look into the chat as uh, discussion going on and on and on. Um, and now, Bob, I think um, our next speaker is ready with a Mac. Uh, um, and uh, uh, Dr. Kennedy uh, apparently decided after watching a, a, a documentary with uh, Larry Bird, uh, where he used his non-dominant left hand uh, to play an entire basketball game, uh, uh, Brandon decided to brush his teeth with his left hand for the rest of his life. I hope your teeth are okay. Um, and uh, at this point, uh, he is going to speak to us uh, 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 about the language used to consent patients for trainee involvement in surgery, uh, patient comprehension. All right, Dr. Kennedy. Anyway, go ahead and uh, floor John. We're looking forward to hearing your talk. Okay. Can you all see my screen now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, my name is Brandon Kennedy. I'm a first year ophthalmology resident here at the Moran Eye Center, and I will be discussing a presentation entitled Language Used to Consent Patients for Training Involvement in Surgery and Patient Comprehension. I have no conflicts of interest. So some background. Um, so this, this project really stemmed out of Dr. Levin, um, our chief here, her resident research day presentation in Grand Rounds last year about um, training involvement, consent, and ethics. And we, we had a lot of good discussions and learned a lot. Um, we know that um, not only do we have this duty to disclose training involvement, um, patients actually expect this as well, especially when residents are the primary surgeon. And also the, the degree of consent does vary based off of um, trainee level and whether this is disclosed or not. And lastly, we talked a lot about the risk involved and potential complications when trainees are involved in surgeries. So I remember last year as an intern um, hearing this talk and I was at the VA at this time. So one of my responsibilities on ophthalmology is actually to consent um, patients for surgeries. And lots of times these surgeries were surgeries I've never even heard of. So these were some of my thoughts after the presentation last year. But really what I wanted to hone in on is this question here is, does the way we approach trainee um, involvement in our consenting process vary? Um, and I was wondering if this varies myself with other interns, with residents, with fellows and attendings and how they kind of approach this topic. So what we did is we actually did a pilot study and we, we surveyed everyone here at the Moran Eye Center just to kind of get their response of what they actually say to patients when they're consenting for um, resident involvement. And, Here's just kind of four examples here of, of what we heard back. But really what I wanna highlight is what's in the bold terms here. 
And you can see just with four responses to our surveys, there's actually seven different terms used to describe training involvement. And for someone like myself or everyone here who's in the medical field, we understand what a chief resident is, a fellow, a senior resident, attending physician, so forth. But do our patients and parents of patients understand the difference between these terms and the verbiage that we're using? If so, great. And if not, do they really understand uh, who will be doing the surgery, how much, what level of training they're in, and are we actually doing our job of consenting? Um, so that led us to the question in this um, the study here, and we, we really set out to, to understand, do patients understand the terms used to describe training involvement in surgery? So what we did was, was a, a prospective study um, with a web-based anonymous survey, and we um, surveyed the parents of pediatric patients over at the, the Moran Eye Center and the Peds Center. Um, exclusion were patients who were having surgery within the next one month um, to kind of help decrease uh, proximity and urgency bias. And we also stratified for some demographics. And here is a snippet kind of of part of our survey. And you can see at the top, um, we wanted to assess the perceived confidence of our participants and their understanding of these common terms that we use when consenting for training involvement. So we used a Likert scale. You can see here going from not at all confident to very confident. And then we wanted to um, compare this perceived confidence with participants' um, ability to actually answer these true or false statements, kind of defining these terms and see if there's any discrepancy in their perceived confidence their actual ability to understand the terminology that we're using. So here is some preliminary data. Our sample size right now is about 38 with a 90% 90, uh, 90 response rate. And we're, we're aiming to answer that um, question of how confident are participants in these terms. And you can see there's an overwhelming positive response. The majority of our participants are either somewhat or very confident in the common terminologies that we use, with most confident being medical student, least confident being fellow, however, still overall very confident in, in their understanding of these terms that we use. However, when we compare that with their ability to answer these true or false statements defining these terms, we, we see some somewhat surprising data here. Um, for example, highlighted here, almost half of our population size um, said false that a resident is a physician. Um, and then you can see about a quarter uh, said false and attending is a physician, then almost a third said true and attending is a trainee. In regards to our population data, um, so far in the preliminary stages, however, the majority of our patients, actually all were English speaking um, adults for ages of 20 to 40. Um, most of them did not work in healthcare and the majority of them also had some type of college degree. So really kind of um, not to draw too much conclusion from this preliminary data, uh, but you can already see a little bit of discrepancy of how participants or the parents of these patients feel the confidence in the terminology that we're commonly using to describe training involvement in the consenting process versus their ability to actually um, answer these true or false statements about these terms that really define these terms. And if there is this discrepancy, then I do believe that does pose an ethical dilemma um, of do these patients actually fully understand what they're consenting to and the terminology, who will be doing the surgery, what level of training they're at, how much risk does this pose? So really <clears throat> driving home that top point is what we've been talking about here is does this pose an ethical question in regards to um, our consenting process if patient comprehension is really not well understood, which leads us to the next steps moving forward. Uh, should we standardize the terminology or use definitions in the consenting process? Um, I know at the Moran, we do have a, a kind of a blank statement at the top of each um, consenting packet saying, you know, there will be a training involvement. Do you consent? Do you agree? Um, but are we defining those terminologies? Are we saying the same language? when we're actually speaking to these patients in clinic versus what they're signing up for. And then lastly, um, still in the preliminary stages, but would these results vary if there's a non-English speaking population? Um, the majority of our, our patients were um, English speaking, and if there's an additional language barrier, 
could this make things even more difficult in, in regards to the patient comprehension of the common terms that we use when consenting? So that is uh, my presentation. And I would like to say a special thank you uh, mostly to Dr. Levin um, in helping out with this, this project and kind of carrying it forward, as well as Dr. Jardine, um, Dr. Wylander, who was our cornea fellow last year, as well as one of our interns, Dr. M. McCarty. Thank you, everyone. And for questions. Bob, will you moderate? Yes, so, uh, Brandon, do you have a question for you? Do you think that there are things that we should change right now before waiting to kind of look in and answering these other questions that would be you know, a huge uh, improvement uh, in our current practice? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I don't know if I have um, the, the capacity to fully answer that as I have not rotated through a lot of the surgical specialties that we do our second year. I know at the VA, um, as interns, we were previously doing the consenting process and, and we were taught this consenting process and disclosing a, of training involvement kind of from intern to intern. So really there's no protocol there's no definitions, and, and I think we could definitely improve that process at the VA, which we already have started, because now we're doing a lot of the consenting in the H&P uh, with the PGY2s and 3s, um, who, are, who are further along in their training than also, again, at bedside. But in regards to the, the Moran consenting process, um, I would have to take a little bit deep, deeper look and then also hopefully gain a little more experience um, during the next couple of years to help answer that question. Great, thanks. I think Tyler has his hand up here. Hey, thanks, Brandon. Um, hey, I guess I had a question or, or I should say a comment about, you know, when I can send patients, I often use, like at the VA, I often use statistics that come from large clinical trials that are performed mainly by senior attending physicians and not residents. And I think it'd be interesting to elucidate whether or not uh, trainees uh, or, or how we adjust the stats that we report to our patients and how those stats would impact their decision, whether or not it would at all, um, would be kind of an interesting question to, to piggyback off of your project. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, I find myself guilty of kind of pulling these stats, not all the times. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I'll talk about the studies that I know and the increased risk uh, specific to the kind of the level of training, depending on how comfortable the patients are. So yeah, it would be interesting um, to kind of see if there's any, any protocol or any standardized approach to disclosing uh, more data and if that would, would be uh, a good step moving forward. Okay. I think at this point, now I want to direct you to the chat. There are a lot of really interesting comments uh, I, I think that you've uh, stirred up a, a fair amount of uh, discussion. Um, I think it's also probably time for us to take a brief break. We're gonna take about 10 minutes. Uh -huh.